the having is a huge deal. Uh, so just to be clear, everyone is aware of the fixed supply of Bitcoin. There will only ever be 21 million, but not all 21 million have been issued to the world yet. And so Bitcoin is on a fixed issuance schedule. Satoshi programmed when he launched, he or she or they launched Bitcoin on how those would be issued out. We're at about 19 million out of 21 so far. And every 10 minutes, more and more get issued. And the halving is when that issuance schedule gets cut in half. So the supply, the forced sellers, those that pay money to produce Bitcoins, which then have to sell it to pay for their costs, that's going to be halved. And so the really simple way to think about it, Ed, is if demand remains the same and the Bitcoin sold gets cut in half, it should have an impact on the price to the upside. So it's a big event and we're all pretty excited about it. I mean, let's dumb it down. The, the problem with central planning money, which is such a core technology to society working. Think about it, Ed. You go to work every single day and you pour your blood, sweat, and tears all of the time you spend on this planet in exchange for what? Money. So right. the central planning of money convolutes and complicates so much of the inner workings of society. Let's go back to basics. Our government is in debt, right? Yes or no? The U.S. government, that is. What? All governments, right? Our government's yes. in debt. Okay, traditionally, Ed, if I owed you 20 bucks, I'd have two options. I'd one have to default on that and say, you know what, Ed, I hope you still consider me a good friend, but I'm not going to make whole on that $20. The other is I could pay it back. Those are classically the two options that anyone in debt has, right? Now, the government, because they centrally plan and control our currency, unfortunately has a third, and that's that they can print more money, devalue the debt that they have and that they owe and allocate more capital to themselves. So our government can't default. The U.S., the United States of America cannot default on debt. It would collapse the entire planet. We also cannot afford to pay it back. So if you just – like, listen, I didn't even go to college, brother. This is just 101 basics how the world works. If we can't default and we can't pay it back – What's the only option that they have to do? No matter what they sit and tell you at the Fed chair meetings and all of the economists, they have to issue more dollars. And so if there's going to be more pieces of green paper, you want them competing for the most fixed thing, right? There's more right. dollars that are competing for a fixed amount of Bitcoin. And, Jack, and yes, real estate's going to go up too because there's more dollars competing for real estate. But they can make more real estate. They can find more gold. They can't make any more Bitcoins. And that's just, I mean, even a college dropout can understand that, my friend. Welcome, Welcome to the Crypto, crypto teacher. teacher. And you know I come back with that video just to make you think. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. And make sure you're joining the Patrons. If you're not a part of the Patrons, make sure you're hitting the cash out. And we have Jack Mahler on the having. And the having is right around the corner. And, of course, the media is asking, are we going to pump? Are we not going to pump? It's definitely already priced in, guys. We know we never pump around the halving, but we do have Coinbase launching futures at the beginning of the month, and we know how the media is going to play it. And after the halving, this digital economy, Bitcoin and crypto will go behind the curtain until the end of the year. And remember the crypto teacher told you. And Jack Mahler talks about the Fed, all this debt, the central banks printing money. But never forget, if you understood how the Fed worked, if you understood how the economy worked, this was a debt-based system. Corporate debt was great. Personal debt, it turned you into a slave. Those who understood that took advantage. And that's the reason why it's so important for you to learn this new digital economy so therefore, you're not caught on the wrong side of history. Now we have the SEC movie continues. We have the SEC going after Ripple for $2 billion. And I'll be going over that more in the morning. But we have Chris from Fidelity Digital Assets speaking about the pump in crypto. And guys, the only thing I have to do is look at the Fed. Even when you're talking about the halving, every pump came from the Fed. Remember, Bitcoin was created so therefore they could bring in this digital economy, the fourth industrial revolution. When you look at the pumps right now, when you had the Bitcoin ETF, the billions that came in came from institutions. Right now, guys, overall, the retail investor is broke. They're being crushed by inflation. 
It's the institutions and the hedge fund guys. And never forget Bitcoin was created to open the door for tokenization. And remember the crypto teacher told you. And will the Fed cut rates? And guys, we know the inflation that we have right now is all about corporate greed. There's a handful of companies that own everything. And we have yield rates are so low because we see all the manipulation. And we see the Fed cutting liquidity, even though Jerome Powell stated he was going to slow it. But we definitely see the liquidity pulling back. And then plus, because rates are higher for longer, it is crushing the economy. Remember, guys, we're in a fragmented world. They have to destroy this legacy market in order for the fourth industrial revolution to arise. Whether robots, algorithms, and drones take the economy over, pay each other with crypto, and the sheep go inside the metaverse. And we have the major central banks moving in lockstep when it comes to interest rates. And don't forget the simulation I bought you of Gary Gensler speaking of currency, because we're definitely going into a currency war in order to get to that level playing field. If Japan keeps raising rates, if the BRICS nations get off the dollar, what do you think is going to happen to the dollar? It's going to get destroyed. Lose that world reserve currency title. And then we're going to have the BRICS nations led by China with that digital yuan to rise. And that's the reason why our United States CEOs are in China. And we know what that's called. It starts with a T. And the fall of America to Babylon is happening right in front of the United States people's eyes while they distracted on things that don't matter. And remember the crypto teacher told you. Because he knows when it comes to the NWO, it's all planned out. You have a wonderful day. Make up the current state of things in the market. Yeah, so obviously we've had a, a very volatile more than a year. 2023, 20, uh, we were up 155% Bitcoin. And now we've uh, kind of rocketed out of the gate once again, up 50% year to date. Um, so I think what you're seeing is after this long bear market, we're once again seeing the, the cycle turn uh, for a number of reasons. And a lot of people are once again rediscovering Bitcoin. We've obviously had the approval of the exchange traded products, which are helping with demand. Uh, and then you have things like the upcoming Bitcoin halving, which people are now turning towards. We are coming up on the end of the quarter here, which of course kicks off with the launch of all of these new Bitcoin ETFs. Yeah, so the ETFs were very interesting because we did get kind of the classic Wall Street buy the rumors, sell the news. The day they were approved, we got almost a 20% pullback and everyone said, uh, maybe not, not a big deal. And then since then, I've been absolutely very wrong about this. I thought this would be kind of a slow burn for these things, that we would get uh, demand as people started to put them into their portfolios. Our RIAs became uh, aware of them. They were talking to their clients about them. I thought this would take years, which it, ha it still will, you know, in the long term. But in the medium term, we've seen a huge flow uh, of, if you see this in the, the trading volumes, as well as the actual uh, money flows into these products. And so that's providing a, a massive source of demand, which I think is helping to drive the price up right now. Ebbs and flows, like you get, and it follows the price. If you look at the price on a log chart, you see the price move up really quickly and then dr have massive drawdowns. And I think adoption is the same. The, the price moves up, it gets more people interested, they become educated, they say, maybe I want to hold some of this for the long term. Uh, but then, of course, there's also traders and speculators that, that whipsaw the asset around. Um, but each time you go up, you draw down, you go up again, you don't keep going back down. And I think adoption is the same. A new wave of people come in, and then those people are now educated. They now understand it. And then another cohort of people come in, and now they understand it. And so I would expect the same pattern to continue uh, through the rest of the year, and really, you know, multiple cycles after this. How is this year's having different, if at all? Yeah, so the big difference is we've hit a new all-time high before the halving has even taken place. So that's never been done before. Obviously, we just talked about the exchange-traded products are probably playing some role there. Um, but the other thing is that, you know, this time, it's every time we have a halving, it's, of course, half as much, right? And so the, the supply is going to get cut in half again, but it's not as much as before. 
So I think there's some debate as to whether it's going to have as big of an impact as before or whether the, the previous halvings uh, had a much bigger impact because they had kind of this supply shock. So maybe not as big of a supply shock this time around, but I think we have a bigger demand shock this time. So we'll, we'll see how those two uh, kind of play against each other. Silly expectation of six cuts, and now we're bopping around three, two to three. I think uh, that will impact the bills market, but I think here's the key point. We're, we're looking at the smoke rather than the locomotive. In other words, what you see first is what goes up, and you pay attention to it. That's what the Native American tribes did, made mm -hmm. the mistake uh, when they were watching the railroads being built. The, the railroad, the engine here driving the yield curve is the U.S. Treasury. Look at this auction schedule that we have right now. When they come to market for $60 billion for 10 years, and they've shoved things into the bill in six-month and one-year space, that's why rates are above 5%. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to look at how, what the Fed might do. I think it's equally important to look at what Treasury is doing. These borrowing levels are ungodly. And the dealers are going to have to deal with this. We're seeing some backup. We're seeing some tails on these auctions. To me, that's what I would be focusing on, as well as focusing on the, the dot plot, the SEP, whatever the Fed may be doing. Put pressure on providing that supply versus relative to demand. But right now, we're seeing that in the shorter space. Remember, at the end of last year, they decided too much pressure would be in the 7, 10 year, et cetera. Uh, and now they're focused on the bills, six months, one year. Mm -hmm. And I think that is one of the reasons we're seeing these highly elevated rates. So would they put up with a bit of inflation? No. I, I think he's hard over on that subject. And remember, he and the FOMC were embarrassed by embracing the transitory argument. Mm -hmm. The horse left the barn, as I like to say. It took them a while to get it back inside the barn, the inflationary horse. And now they're calming it down. So he emphasizes with every presser that he has that this is, has to be a sustainable movement to the 2% target. I can't see them abandoning that at all, particularly with unemployment at 3.9%. Do you realize how low that is mm -hmm. historically? 4% is low. 4.5% is actually low. So I, I don't see them giving in Richard, early and adopting a Richard, higher target. The developed world central banks, particularly mm -hmm. in the West, so you know the, the Swiss have obviously already gone, ECB, Bank of England, uh, particularly, I think, dovish comments from, from Andrew Bailey relative to how he normally talks last Friday in, in an FT interview. Mm -hmm. Will they all want to move together? Will, will, will none of these central banks want to be left behind for that first rate cut, at least, to, to signal that we're changing direction or not? Will the Fed be focused just on the statistics here? Just on the statistics here. Mm -hmm. And remember, they don't all move together. Japan just barely moved, right? Mm -hmm. So they waited, 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 waited. That's a special situation. But no, I think the Fed will do what's in our best interest here in the United States, and that's their principal preoccupation. Steve, quick final word. Yeah, very quickly. Uh, Richard is 100% right. The only difference would be severe movements in the currency might create some change as to when they want to, as the extent to which they want to match or not match uh, other central banks. Uh, if they need to to keep the, the uh, dollar from crashing or the euro from crashing, we're nowhere near that. But only the currency differentials mm -hmm. that affected the economy would cause that kind of concern with moving together. And Wilfred, we're nowhere near that. No. The DXY is trading at 104 plus. Mm -hmm. Everybody talks about dollar weakness because it went up to 112, but it's been holding steady. It's still above where it was 20 years ago. Um, I, I guess... My first question is about this gathering today. Who is there? We've been talking all morning about the high-profile U.S. CEOs that are there. Who's there from the Chinese side? And uh, are they senior enough that it actually makes this gathering quite significant? Oh, yeah, 100%. I think the very key is the keynote speech was given by Premier Li, who really reiterated the continued opening up of China, as well as addressing and, and acknowledging some of the challenges China's economy faces, but reiterating their openness to uh, foreign investors, foreign corporations, as well as uh, pushing a little bit of a domestic consumption story, something that would really benefit a lot of those uh, U.S. CEOs from multinationals that are doing great business in China today. And, and are Tim Cook and Apple positively embraced? Um, are they seen as Apple as opposed to America's biggest company if they are currently the biggest this week? 
Yeah, I mean, last week, uh, Tim Cook opened the 35th uh, I, iPhone store, the 35th uh, Apple store in China, in Shanghai, their largest store. Uh, and thousands, thousands of people were waiting for the store to open. He was given almost like a hero's welcome in China, which just shows it's not just a venerable, uh, well-respected brand here in the U.S., but certainly globally, including in China. Going to a different economy. And we're going to be learning more about that uh, as we go. But clearly, we're, we're, we're learning that things can be done uh, from remote, remote locations. We're learning that technology can replace people even more than we thought. We're not going back to the same economy. We're, going, we're recovering, but to a different economy. And it'll be one that is more leveraged to technology. And I worry that that is going to make it even more difficult than it was for, for many workers in Silicon Valley and my friends who work in technology know that what we did to the manufacturing workers, we are now going to do to the retail workers, the call center workers, the fast food workers, the truck drivers, and then even bookkeepers, accountants, uh, insurance agents, lawyers, and on and on through the economy. So what happened to the manufacturing workers is a very clear sign. And so we'll import Chinese-based CBDC technology. So it's going to be CBDC in a box. Uh, provided to you by the People's Bank of China. But every stock, every bond, every currency, every commodity, every piece of art, every private business, every piece of real estate will eventually be a token on a blockchain, an entry on a ledger, permanent and immutable. We will have truth instead of trust, and we will save over $7 trillion a year. Six to 8% of global GDP is wasted by the friction of the trust industry that's necessary when you have dual entry accounting. With triple entry accounting, which is what a blockchain is, mm -hmm. we get rid of all of that friction. It's a beautiful future. Like what you see in China and their social credit scoring systems, right? If we get identity wrong, you know, it could be a tool to enslave humanity. And if we get it right, it could be a tool to liberate humanity as an American, you know. Uh, uh, I'm obviously rooting for the, the one that's on the side of freedom. Bitcoin is an international asset. And also, I do believe the role of crypto is, um, it is, it, it is it's digitizing gold. I actually believe this technology is going to be very important. I am, I, you know, look at it. We have been part of a huge revolution in investing through ETFs. We believe that ETFs will be changing the whole way we invest. Many people still use it as a means, well, people are investing it f for indexing. No, the majority of people who are putting money in an index, in an ETFs are active investors that are buying exposure. The entire bond market is being transformed as we talk right now. I believe the next generation for markets, the next generation for securities will be, will be tokenization of securities. Um, we will, and if we can have that distributed ledger that we know every beneficial owner, every beneficial uh, seller, we all have our, our, our code right. of who's buying, who's selling, instantaneous settlement. And think about it, it changes the whole ecosystem. Chinese bank ICBC has been hit by a ransomware attack, and the U.S. Treasury market, as a result of that, um, has been disrupted. This, according to the Financial Times, we're going to get more right now with Bloomberg's Shanali Basic. Shanali, what do we know? Uh, listen, we have the Financial Times now reporting that ICBC, one of China's largest banks here, was hit with a ransomware attack. And remember, they're a, a very significant intermediary in the Treasury market. The SIFMA has told as members that this has been part of the reason here uh, that the system is kind of clogged up, if you will, during that auction that we saw a little bit before. The attack had prevented ICBC, according to the Financial Times, from settling treasury trades on behalf of other market participants. A large executive at a major bank also telling the paper that such a large party on the fixed income clearing corp uh, creates major concerns, potentially impacting the liquidity of treasury markets. Now it was not just the poor auction. It was absolutely lousy, and, and uh, uh, you know, when, when the dealers have to step in to save a treasury auction, uh, that's a rare occurrence. And Very much a traditionalist. I like staying with the dollar. You know that from when I was there. It's make, mm -hmm. make the dollar the choice. I hate when countries go off the dollar. I would not allow countries to go off the dollar, because when we lose that standard, 
that will be like uh, losing a revolutionary war. That will be that will be a hit to our country, just like losing a war. And we can't let that happen. And too many countries now are fighting to get off the dollar. And crypto teacher and the new world order book plus the three kids books is time to reeducate. Also, new to cryptos, Coinbase, Bitchu, Binance. Do not forget book links and crypto links are in the description. The stock channel, guys. Don't forget to go like, subscribe, spread everywhere. You have your Kobo, your chip size, your banking, your gaming. While everybody's sitting at home, get on stocks, the see with the biotech stocks. And while everybody's at home wishing, they were still getting that free money. What are they doing? Drinking and smoking weed. Don't forget about those stocks and you have a wonderful day. Most powerful person in the world is the storyteller. The storyteller sets the vision, values, and agenda of an entire generation to come, Steve Jobs. And guys, you know I truly believe in this. When you look at the New World Order, they're the storytellers. And that's the reason why I wrote my New World Order book. But guys, now it's time to change the current generation. And I wrote three kids' books. You know I love the Trinity because I understand the power that's in it. So I have three books. We have an opportunity to change the generation, to educate not just me, but I want to show you that I take action on a daily basis. And I want you to take action on a daily basis. Whether it's your job, whether it's in your community, we have an opportunity right now to educate the masses. I posted this on my Twitter account. Please share, but this is a short clip of the three books. There's going to be a clothing line and action figures. Please get these books for your kids, nephews, cousins, friends, so therefore we can start the re-education now. Because as we see, the fourth industrial revolution foundation is definitely here. Robots, algorithms, drones, taking humanity out the picture. We have to re-educate. But let's get into the video. Part 1, King Yahshua and Dramatium. Face the villain. Part two. King Yashu and Drama Team. Save New York. Long COVID 33. Part three. King Yashu and Drama Team. Goes to China. It's mandatory to get part one, part two, and part three of this series. It's time to re educate Generation Z.